Good evening. For those of you who I have not had the pleasure to meet, I am Tia Benson Toll, the MRS president, and I would like you to welcome you to tonight's uh, Kavli Early Career Award and Distinguished Lectureship in Nanoscience. I'm really pleased to be here with, with you tonight and to introduce our recipients. I had the pleasure of attending the, the Kavli Awards this summer in, uh, in Norway, and just the association with that uh, group is, is phenomenal, and we really value our, uh, our collaboration. We're definitely pleased to partner with the Kavli Foundation on both of these distinguished awards. and their work. The Foundation's mission is implemented through an international program of research institutes, professorships, symposia, and other initiatives in the field of astrophysics, nanoscience, neuroscience, and theoretical physics. The Foundation is also a founding partner of the Kavli Prizes, which recognize scientists for their seminal advances in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. Definitely a, a very esteemed uh, group. We're very pleased to partner with them. And I will get right to the chase here and, and tell you that it's my pleasure to introduce the recipient of the Kavli Early Career Award in Nanoscience, Julia Greer from California Institute of Technology. I invite you to join me. Uh, Professor Greer's talk is entitled Three-Dimensional Architected Nanostructured Metamaterials. I'm sure we'll all enjoy her talk. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone for being here. Thank you for the, the introduction. Thank you for this award. I'm, I'm really honored and flattered. And ironically enough, I'm actually going to Norway on Wednesday, <laughs> not to the Kavli Foundation. Um, so, so I'll begin by trying to decipher what my title means here. So this is Materials by Design, Three-Dimensional Architected Nanostructured Metamaterials. This is a mouthful. So even if you understand each word as a single <laughs> isolated word, doesn't mean that they all belong in a sentence together. And so my goal for this talk is to convey to you what, why they all fit together and what this means. So we, I imagine that we've all encountered situations like these. When you have a paper bag or maybe a plastic bag and it rips and the contents all falls down on the floor, and this is just really bad news. And it doesn't take much to recognize that we have these kinds of problems everywhere from the ripped plastic bags to the wine glasses that shatter in your hand before the toast to the, oh yeah, I swear I planned for that baby. So you realize very quickly that materials that are very lightweight also are susceptible to damage and to tear. And so they break very, very easily. Okay, so let's look at the other end of the spectrum and let's look at these two beautiful airplanes. So this is the Boeing 747. I imagine many of you, including myself, took these kinds of uh, machines to come here. And you can see that from the 60s up to here, we already are desperately trying to reduce the weight of these machines. So these are made out of some of the most damage tolerant materials, but they're very, very heavy. We're going from about a million pounds and the Dreamliner, of course, has, uh, has now reduced its weight to about half of what the 747 used to be. And so it uses about 20% less fuel and is about 30% less costly. So what we learned from that is that the materials that are strong are also heavy and therefore expensive. So it seems like there's a paradox. They're, they're, the materials that are light appear to be always weak. And wouldn't it be great if they were stronger? And then the materials that are strong appear to be heavy and wouldn't it be great if they were more lightweight? And so speaking of lightweight and strong materials, whatever happened to that space elevator? Remember how about a decade ago we were all dreaming about that? Well, why haven't we built one yet? Well, it turns out that the reason why is because there are no materials that are both lightweight and strong enough simultaneously. And the reason for that is because of this coupling between strength and density. So what I'm choosing to plot here is the strength, but this can be any mechanical attribute. It could be fracture toughness. It could be stiffness as a function of density. And these are log, this is a log-log plot. So what that means is that even a small increment in the, in the white space here already means a substantial change. And what that shows you is that all the materials that we know how to make today are plotted right here. And so what we know is that 
If we want the materials to be strong, they will necessarily be heavy. So these are some of the metallic alloys. These are some of the ceramics here, some of the very, very uh, strongest materials that we know. And then materials that are, all, that are lightweight appear to be very weak. So what do we need to do to improve that performance? So what we really want is to hit this white space. We really want to start making materials that are both lightweight and at the same time very strong. Of course, we can't go above and beyond the theoretical maximum. So these are the atomic bonds. But this, this region, the white space over here, is rather untapped. And so, so the question is, how do we do this? If everything that we already know how to make today is already plotted here, how do we hit this white space? OK, so this is what I'd like to tell you today. And what we use is a concept that's very similar to this. We're using architecture in material design. If you look at the Great Pyramid of Giza, maybe some of you have actually seen it in real life. It's an impressive, it's an impressive man-made structure. In fact, it's the largest uh, man-made stone monument. And you look at its height, it's about 150 meters, so that's pretty tall. And you look, it's very, very heavy. If you look at the weight at the base, it's, it's, uh, it's about 10,000 tons per meter square. So it's ex that's an extremely high pressure. Now, in contrast to the Eiffel Tower, that's an engineered structure. Now, it's twice as tall, right? And it's just as strong. And it weighs three orders of magnitude less. So what that tells you is that by using engineering, we can build structures that are much more robust to damage and that are, that are a lot more lightweight. And so this is the concept that we are using in the design of our materials. So when, when we first started this work, we began with the micro lattices. And some of you may have seen this image. This is a real micro lattice that's sitting on a real dandelion. There's no photoshopping. This is not the world's strongest dandelion. This is a normal dandelion. And this, this micro lattice that's sitting on top of it is made out entirely of nickel, but it happens to be about 99.8% air. And so if I were to hold one of these micro lattices in one hand and a feather in the other and release them in the air, the feather would fall down faster. These are really, really, really lightweight. Now, these were made at Hughes, at, with our collaborators uh, at Hughes Research Lab, or HRL. This is a beautiful laboratory in, in uh, Malibu. Now, what we're shooting for is not just the lightweight, which is what these are. But we're also we're looking for the simultaneous lightweight and the strength. And for that, we have to go down in size. And so what we make in my group at Caltech is the nano lattices. And these are some of the examples that I'm showing you here. These three are the CAD designs. So these were generated by a computer. But the other black and white pictures right here, these are all real images. These are real samples that we have made in my group. And just to show you how diverse they are, these are some of the structures that we made relatively recently. So those of you who like Doctor Who, here's the TARDIS. So this is about the size of maybe one thousandth of your hair diameter, this TARDIS. Um, this is a truncated dodecahedron, so they're effectively um, a little bit like a soccer ball, and they're all open. You can see this is called a kagome lattice, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this, but this is something that nature uses a lot in two dimensions, for example, in the butterfly wings. So these are like stars of David that are tessellated through space. Now, these different architectures contain about 99.9% .9 air. And the reason why is because there's two levels of porosity. The first thing is that these are cellular structures. You can see they're very open. But the, each individual beam member is actually a hollow beam member, and so this is what you see here. So if you look at the scale by here, the thickness, the wall thickness here, can be anywhere between 10 nanometers and 50 nanometers. So now we're talking about 100,000th of your hair diameter. So these are very, very small and open structures. Now, a structure that we made a couple of months ago is a fractal nanotrust. We're looking at the effects of hierarchy in these. So not only is this entire structure a nano lattice, but each individual beam is now made out of the nano uh, lattices itself. And we have now made several degrees of hierarchy. So you can see, um, so that we can study the effects of hierarchy. So the reason why we're calling these metamaterials now and how they're different from the micro lattices is that the size of the unit cell starts to approach the dimensions of the characteristic internal material length scale. So these are all, your eye can't resolve these. So if you were to look, if we were to make maybe a centimeter by a centimeter by a 100 micron thick uh, little coupon, which is kind of like a little square of a piece of paper, it would look like a cloud sitting on your hand. But it wouldn't crumple like an aerogel would. It's just, a, it's, it's very, very strong. And so your eye can't resolve these features. Your eye, th this is, we're showing you this in the electron microscope, but your eye wouldn't be able to resolve these features. And so this is in part why we're calling these metamaterials, but these not so much, because structural mechanics can't describe their, their deformation alone anymore. When we built the Eiffel Tower, or we didn't, but whoever built the Eiffel Tower, guess Mr. Eiffel, um, they were able to describe its properties just based on the continuum mechanics models. 
This is not possible for these kinds of structures because now it's the interplay of not just the structural effects but the material effects. And I'll elaborate on this in the, in the next slide. So what I mean by this is that there is a so-called size effect in nanomaterials. If you, look, if you take a common metal, gold, copper, nickel, in its very pristine form, you, you can plot its strength, this is some kind of strength, as a function of its size. And what you'll see very quickly, again, this is a log-log plot, is that there is this phenomenon that's called smaller is stronger. So for these metals, you take gold, it's very malleable, you reduce it to the size of about 200 nanometers, and it becomes as strong as steel. There are reasons for that, and I'm happy to, uh, to talk about that as well, but this is, this is not, uh, not about, that's not what this talk is about. So smaller is stronger. Okay, so, so what that tells us is that maybe we can tune the strength by size reduction. Now take exactly the same metal and deposit it differently, deposit it by a different technique, and of course there are plenty of these techniques, and such that there are now multiple grains in the structure. And all of a sudden, you see exactly the opposite effect. So when you populate the same metals, like the gold, the nickel, the copper that we were describing, all of a sudden you see that the emergence of the smaller is weaker. Now this is a more modest effect, it's not an log log plot, but it's still something to be aware of. So sometimes there's materials can be stronger, sometimes they can be weaker, but actually the size effect doesn't manifest itself only in strength. Sometimes it manifests itself in transitioning a material from being intrinsically brittle to being ductile. For example, metallic glasses, it's a type of glass which is made out entirely of metals, but it's a glass and we all know what happens when a glass shatters, on, falls down on the floor, it, it shatters. What we were able to show is that at a small enough size, the, these glasses become ductile without any sacrifice in strength. So this is the strength as a function of size. It looks like we're not losing the strength. They're still, they still remain strong, but we're now able to deform them, deform them a lot more than we would ever be able to do it in a large material. Now, in the case of ceramics, we also showed that smaller can be tougher, and what that means is that smaller can be harder to break. So the bottom line here is this. Sometimes materials can get stronger. Some other times they get weaker, and sometimes they stop breaking. But these effects only emerge at the nanoscale. And so this is why it's very important that we make the nano lattice as opposed to the micro lattices so that we're able to harness maybe the size effect. This is something that we're calling the material size effect and proliferate it onto the larger scale. So just to, to, to demonstrate this effect, I'd like to show you this video. So what this is, it's a ceramic nano lattice so that my student Lucas made. So, so this is an octet geometry. These are all open, hollow beam members, and they're constructed in an octet lattice that, that's um, uh, about 99% air, probably a little bit more than 99% air. So imagine a piece of chalk with a severe case of osteoporosis. It's very, very, very open and very porous and also very brittle. This is alumina. Okay, alumina is, is a little bit like a piece of chalk. So, so what should happen when we start compressing it? Anybody? <laughs> when you have a very, very porous piece of chalk and you start compressing it with very, very thin walls. It should crumple, right? And fracture and break and then all sorts of bad things should happen, right? So let's see what actually happens. So I'm gonna play this video for you. So here we are, we're compressing it, we're compressing it and bam. thickness in these is about 50 nanometers. Okay, that's the wall thickness. So we're already in the nanometer regime. So you look at this and you say, well, what, you told us that there was a material size effect, but, but uh, there's nothing different. Here, I'm showing you the video one more time. So it loads, it unloads, and that's it. Nothing interesting. Okay, well, there is one thing that is kind of neat, and that is that it's still strong. So for something that's this much air, that's 99% air, it's about 27 MPa. So the fact that we're able to measure the strength still in MPa actually means something. So they remain relatively strong, even, even being this, this um, thin walled. Now, we're an experimental group mainly, so we don't give up at just a single experiment. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to repeat exactly the same experiment, but at the wall thickness, reducing the wall thickness by a factor of five. So now our wall thickness is going to be 10 nanometers only. Okay, it was 50 nanometers, now it's gonna be 10 uh, nanometers only, and we're going to do exactly the same experiment. So here's, here's the movie. And so we're compressing this very, very, very porous piece of chalk. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a piece of chalk do this. So not only is it compressing almost to about 50%, 
but it fully recovers. So Lucas just made a ceramic that's 99% air that recovers after compressing it. These are not properties that you would expect. And these are very much um, not, not something that we would expect. So and the only difference between these two is the wall thickness. So one thing that's very interesting to notice here is that, is that the same material deposited by exactly the same technique wrapped around a three-dimensional architecture is able to, to exhibit completely different behavior. So the way you can think about it is that we took a two-dimensional nano ribbon and then we wrapped it around a three-dimensional architecture. Now we, got, we get entirely different behavior. So I told you something about the combination of the lightweight and the strength, so let's see where these nano trusses land. So here's our Ashby plot that I showed before, and here's where our data points are. All the purple points and all the orange points are actually ours. So what we're showing is that, sure, we're not quite up here yet, but we're getting really close to it. We're already pushing, very much pushing the boundaries here, pushing the envelopes into this white space. And not only that, but it turns out we've actually made some of the most lightweight and strongest uh, uh, materials that exist uh, here today. Now, does anybody want to know why this happened? <laughs> okay, good. So, so let me just summarize what you observed. So, so what we are showing here is that the strength, the toughness, and the recoverability are all can be controlled by the architecture, the fact that these are nanomaterials, and the microstructure together in concert. So it's no longer sufficient to only look at it It's no longer sufficient to look at the individual aspects here, but we really have to consider them all together. And if we do that, we can actually design entirely new classes of materials, just like we're showing you here. This is how you hit the white space. But there is an interesting. So I'm I'm going to tell you a little bit about why um, this happened. So. It turns out that the, the answer is purely mechanistic. I don't know if there are any mechanics people here. But there are two different ways that a structure that's made out of tubes can fail. It can either fail by yielding, and in this case, it's made out of a brittle material. So yielding here means failing, means fracture. Or it can buckle. Now, when brittle materials fail, like I said, they, they don't yield, they, they don't extend, they don't deform, they just, they just catastrophically fail. Now, there's a competition of these two modes, and it turns out that there's a critical ratio between the wall thickness and the radius of the tubes that comprise the nanotruss. And if that wall, if that critical uh, ratio is at about 0.03 and below 0.03, it's, it, the structure is going to be able to buckle, and so the entire deformation will commence smoothly, and then we'll be able to recover. And if it's above that ratio, then it'll be catastrophic. So let's see if this is actually what happens. So. With a 10 nanometer wall thickness, our ratio is about 0.016, so that's below. And so these are the different unit cells that Lucas compressed. This is the image after the recovery, after the compression. So you would never, and these are compressed to about 50% strain. You would never be able to tell that these images are taken after the deformation because they look exactly the same. So they recovered 100%. Now let's increase the wall thickness a little bit. So at 20, wall thickness and 30, 40, and 60, you can see that as you increase it more and more, the deformation becomes more and more catastrophic more and more discrete, and these are all the, the, until it gets to the part, this is the video that I showed you, the 60 nanometer wall thickness where it fails by a single catastrophic um, crushing event. And these are all the images um, after. You can see it's starting to recover more and more, and then when we get to this, to below this critical ratio, it fully recovers. Now, the question is, I told you it was all about the size effect, right? But this explanation is all mechanistic. It's all about the ratio, T over A. Well, if it's all about the ratio T over A, that means that it's scale-free, right? That means that we should be able to scale this thing up to about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers cube or something like this, such that the wall thickness becomes 10 centimeters, right? If we scale it up in a self-similar way. And then we should expect exactly the same behavior, at least based on this theory. Can you imagine concrete tubes with 10 centimeter thick walls arranged into a three-dimensional lattice and then compressing it and actually shell buckling and recovering? That would never happen. So how does size effect manifest itself here? It's not in strength. The reason why this would never happen in a larger structure is because brittle materials fail at the flaws. And we can't make ceramics that don't contain flaws. So if you take a, a ceramic structure, a concrete structure that, whose walls are 10 centimeters, the probability of finding a flaw in there, especially a weak flaw, is 100%. Absolutely, we will find many, many, many flaws, and then at those locations at the flaws, the structure will fail before ever getting a chance to experience shell buckling. But in these structures that are only 10, 10 nanometers thick, first of all, the, the size of the largest flaw is about 10 nanometers. 
Secondly, the probability of finding a flaw in there is, is reduced significantly. So the size effect manifests itself here in the sense that it's proximity to ideality. We're able to make much more high quality materials in small dimensions much more readily than in large dimensions. But now you can proliferate this little ribbon onto a macro sized material that, that I can hold in my hand that I have sitting in my group. So this is, um, this, this is how, uh, this is the pathway that shows how we can harness the useful properties of a nano size effect and proliferate them onto the larger structures. Now, I showed you a lot of videos, some videos, and you might be wondering about this because I told you that your eye can't see these structures, right? So the largest structures, some of the larger structures that we work with are about 100 microns by 100 microns by 100 microns cubed, and so that's effectively the thickness of a sheet of paper. Now, and the unit cells, of course, are much, much below that. Now, so what we do is we do a lot of our experiments in in situ microscopes. So these microscopes allow us to see what the, allow us not only to see what the structure is doing as it's deforming, but to also collect the mechanical data and also to impose the specific type of deformation that we want. So these are the different grips that we're using. We can do tensile or compressive experiments, and we can do, uh, we can study a variety of different structures. For example, this, this is an example of an octet uh, nano lattice made out of gold. And so you can see how different this behavior is. So this is a nano lattice, similar geometry. But now watch this, we're compressing it, we're collecting the data, and this part of the deformation, this part of the structure doesn't even know it's being compressed. So all the deformation is localized within the structure. So thinking about shock absorbing or thinking about a material that absorbs a lot of energy or, or takes the damage upon itself, this would be a perfect material for that, th those kinds of applications. And interestingly, this one is made out of metal and it doesn't recover at all. So it just stops there doesn't recover at all. So these are the kinds of things we can learn. Now, we can also correlate each one of these undulations with a single layer collapse. So there's a lot, there's a wealth of information that we can learn from this type of an in situ uh, approach. Now, this is another interesting structure. So this is a pyramid that's hierarchical. So each one of the, each individual beam there is made out of, um, of the nano trusses itself. So you can see it's being compressed right now. And this is also made out of hollow, hollow, Alumina. So this one, each individual beam is no longer a tube, but each individual beam is made out of nano trusses itself. So it's effectively a fractal nano truss. And watch this, we're compressing hollow alumina, so it should absolutely break. So we're compressing it a lot, and then bam, it fully recovers. So these ceramic size effects are real. So, and it depends, it doesn't even depend on the geometry. Even under the complex stress states, even when they're really hollow, even when they're really you would never imagine, you would never anticipate these structures to recover. We're absolutely able to, to elicit shell buckling in these structures. Now, I told you we didn't only do compression, we actually do tensile experiments as well. So here's a nano truss that's being tensed. Here we go. And this movie gets a lot more interesting when we get over here. Right, so a lot of people might be wondering well, you showed us what happens in compression, but you didn't show us what happens in tension, so here you go. We're actually pulling on it. Here's this nano truss that's being pulled, I think. <laughs> Pretty sure it's being pulled in very slowly. And there it goes, bam, so it ripped it off. So you can see you can do uh, fracture experiments on these as well. So just because something exhibits really lucrative compressive properties doesn't necessarily mean that the tensile properties are also going to be the same. So because there's no buckling in tension, so we can really start understanding its fracture properties and start understanding its damage properties and whether or not they're sensitive to flaws at these nanometer scales. So this, this in situ approach is a pretty powerful technique. Now, these are really real. So all the, all the experiments that I showed you up to this point, these are not computer simulated, these are not modeled, these are actual structures that we made in our group. Now, I'd like to spend a little bit of time to explaining how we make these structures, if anyone is interested. So we're calling these three-dimensional architected nano metamaterials. So see, it's starting to approach that mouthful in the title that I, that I mentioned earlier. We begin by effectively writing the structure. And the way we do it is we have an instrument called Nanoscribe, and it's a two-photon lithography instrument. So it's a laser. It's a combination of a laser and, a, power, and a, a polymer, such that the constructive interference of two photons within that uh, laser beam, when it crosses the polymer, it creates a voxel, a two-dimensional pixel. It's called a voxel. And within that voxel, it's the constructive interference of the two photons that generates enough power to cross-link that power, power polymer within that voxel. So when you have the voxel and the polymer within it is hardened, now this voxel draws in space. So it's effectively like drawing in three dimensions. So you can imagine it takes forever. It's a very time-consuming technique. But 
what it allows you to do, it allows you to have complexity come for free. So you can write a structure that's very complex, and in a way, that's one of the reasons why I showed you the TARDIS. We're not limited to periodicity. It's not like a single exposure. It's not like uh, a periodic mask in any way, because we can write any pattern that we choose. Now, we have, after we've written the pattern in the polymer, all the liquid parts we, uh, get dissolved away, but now we're not going to, we, we're interested in a variety of different material properties, not in, in polymers only. So what we do after we've created this polymer skeleton is we coat it with another material. And we coat it with something that, that is useful for a particular application. And I'll show you some of the applications that we've uh, already embarked upon in our group. In this particular way, um, the ceramics that we generated that recovered, that the movies that I showed you, we use atomic layer deposition, or ALD, to deposit a conformal layer, like that nano ribbon I was describing. And then we expose the edges and we etch away the polymer. And this is what allows them to be hollow. This is what allows these, these um, structures to contain about 99.9% .9 air. And so I can imagine that some of you might be thinking already, how do we scale these up? These are really great. How, how can we do this? Well, uh, we're thinking about it. So this is something that we're actively, aggressively pursuing right now. Trying to scale them up is probably the largest lo roadblock right now from inserting them into the useful technological applications. Because you can imagine, if we can even print or, or generate um, a 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters sheet of paper like uh, object, nanotrust, it'll be, compl it'll be very stiff, it'll be very strong, extremely lightweight, and completely unterrible. Absolutely unterrible. So you can think of the problems that I mentioned earlier, and then you can, you can already start thinking of how many, how many things they're going to solve. Now, just to show you how much density, how much of a reduction in density we can expect with both hierarchy and making them hollow. So if you take a monolithic cube of a material, and then you start taking away that material in this way by changing the slenderness ratio, and what I mean by that is the length over the diameter. So the slenderness ratio in a structure like this, for example, is 20, and here it's just one, right? You can already hit about uh, two orders of magnitude, so just by going slender. Now, if you now hollow out each beam, you're now able to get another order of magnitude. So just going from a monolithic cube to about 20 slenderness ratio and then hollowing out the tubes, you can lose three orders of magnitude in density. So that's like going from the Great Pyramid of Giza to the Eiffel Tower, right? And then what else you can do is that now you can say, well, instead of each individual beam being a hollow, uh, being a hollow tube by itself, which can shell buckle, we can now instead populate each individual beam with a self-similar structure. It doesn't have to be self-similar, but we could do it in a self self-similar way and also hollow these out. And that buys you two more uh, orders of magnitude. So you can begin, but so you can design your structures to be 100,000 times less dense just by architecting these without any sacrifice in strength. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could mass produce these and make airplanes out of these? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is a pretty powerful uh, way to approach uh, material creation. Now, here's something else I wanted to show you about the size effect. So far, all the structures that I showed you were hollow. Well, sometimes you can imagine that the hollow structures are, are compliant. So if you're looking for a compliant application, absolutely, they're great. But if you're looking for something that's a bit stiffer, you probably don't want them to be hollow, and you may not want them to be made out of polymer, for example, if you want them to be conductive. And I'll show you some of our work on batteries, on um, electrodes in, in energy storage type devices. You want these core regions to be conductive, electrically conductive. So my student at the time, my student Wendy, figured out how to make these be monolithic metallic uh, lattices. And now these are no longer nano lattices. These are actually meso lattices, because if you look at the unit cell, it's about two microns. So Wendy figured out how to do an, inv an inverse of the process that I described, and so she opened up these holes in the resist, and then she electroplated into them. So now when you look at this, at this uh, meso lattice, this is, entirely, this is made out entirely of copper. There's, it's not a core shell structure. They're not hollow. They're entirely monolithic. And now look at the, look at the uh, unit cell here. It's about two microns. Now, this is sort of near and dear to my heart, because when I started my career as a scientist, I'd say, I worked on these really small structures that are called nanopillars, and we were very interested in these fundamental mechanical properties of these very small cylindrical nanopillars, and I've always wondered in the back of my hand, head, what would happen if you arrange these nanopillars sort of in a nano-lego kind of a construction into a lattice of some sort? I guess I've been thinking about this for a lot longer than I'm willing to admit. So in a way, once Wendy showed me this picture, I said, wait a minute, this is exactly what I've been thinking about. These are, these are kind of like nanopillars that are all connected together. So now let's look at the deformation of these structures. So, so look at the individual beam here. So the way this one deformed, I don't know if you can see it, but these are all different crystallographic slip lines. And this is exactly what we would expect for a copper or any kind of a metal 
uh, cylinder to deform like. These are slip lines. Now, looking at the stress-strain curves, they look very different from what I showed you before, right? There is no extended plateau so much. These look more like maybe a combination of a compression and then indentation type of a curve, but they look very different from what we saw before. Now, of course, these are much denser structures, but here's the neat thing. So I'm showing you these, these uh, crystallographic slip lines. So I wanted to, the, uh, the reason why I brought in the nanopillars, brought up the nanopillars, is because this pattern looks very much like the very first gold nanopillar that I made when I was a little grad student. And then this is the very first micropillar that was made um, out of nickel earlier. So you could see these, these uh, by Mike Uchuk. You could see that these are uh, the very sort of very similar crystallographic slip lines that occur in a, in a mesolattice as do in the individual structure. So even under the complex stress states, under complex loading conditions, you already see this behavior. So now let's see what this means. And this is actually a pretty, pretty neat manifestation of a size effect. I'll walk you through this. Imagine a monolithic cube of copper, okay? And if you measure its strength, it would be somewhere over here. So this is strength as a function of relative density. And now these are pretty dense structures. So we're going from about 30, maybe 40% up to 80%. So these are not 99% error. They're much denser structures. But here's what happens. If you take a monolithic cube of copper, it'll be here somewhere. So it's about 120, 130 uh, MPa, right? Usually when you take something monolithic, and then you are going to make a bunch of holes in it, right? We're going to pre-weaken it effectively. So the way you weaken a material is you put a whole bunch of flaws into it, right? You put a bunch of voids, you put a bunch of holes into it, and then when you try to, when you try to compress it, of course, they should be a lot weaker. Not so much here. So watch this. This is the bulk yield strength of copper. This is monolithic copper. And now we take out 20% of the holes out of it, and its strength shoots up by a factor of three. We can make, we can exactly make, we can completely reverse this effect. We can now take out the material out of this monolithic cube of copper and make it stronger by the virtue of the, this nanomaterial size effect. You have to be smart about how you do it, but you can really do it. So now, all of these points, this, the size effect actually manifests itself in two ways here. So these are the blue points and the orange points. These are all the data that Wendy took. So you can see that at about 80% already, at 80% density, you already are getting structures that are much, much stronger than a monolithic copper. But there's another thing. She made two different unit cell sizes. She made a six micron unit cell and an eight micron unit cell. And now she kept the relative density the same, which means that at about 50%, we can look at here, at about 50% relative density, the eight micron, uh, the eight micron struts will be wider than the six micron ones, right? Because she effectively scales it up. So what you see already is that the eight micron is weaker than the six micron one. So basically going smaller always buys you strength even though that in, implies that you're taking the material out. It's very counterintuitive, but it's real. So this is, this is what we discovered. But here's another uh, interesting thing, and this is hopefully some, some work for, for you or for some of our colleagues, is this. At the relatively low density regime, there are actually models. There are quite, Vikram Desponde is, is uh, well known for these, um, a colleague of ours at the University of Cambridge, who designed that there's a model that describes the deformation of an octet lattice with these uh, densities, but only in the low density regime. So it captures this behavior relatively well, and then we can account for the size dependent strength. Okay, so maybe we can capture this behavior. And then at these very high densities of about 80%, well, we can sort of look at it as a composite, the air metal composite, so we can look at the rule of mixtures and maybe capture it pretty well too. But all of this stuff over here, there are no models here that can explain this. All of this, all of this is the manifestation of this combined size effect and architecture that there are no models that described it, its behavior. So this is, this is a great playground for our me mechanician type uh, colleagues. So, so um, we thought this was a pretty neat effect. So here, this is what I, what, uh, this is uh, the tenet, the smaller, stronger size dependence uh, manifests itself here, even in these relatively complex structures. Now, I spent some time telling you about the fundamental science and how, how we make these materials and why and how they are useful. But what I'd like to spend a little bit of time doing now is showing you that they actually have quite a few real technological applications. And I'd like to begin by showing you some of our energy storage efforts. We have a couple of projects on these. So it turns out that for lithium ion batteries, it would be much better to use silicon, which is about a, an order of magnitude greater storage capacity than graphitic carbon, which is what's being used right now for the anode materials in the, in the lithium ion batteries. Well, so this is a schematic of how the battery, a battery cell operates. Well, it turns out that if you were to replace this anode with silicon, this is what you would see. What this is, is a thin silicon film that's very much cracked after you lithiated it. So what happens upon lithiation is that the lithium ions go inside the material, the anodic material, and then it swells up. And if this material happens to be a brittle ceramic, like silicon, 
it would go, undergo the volumetric expansion of about 400%, and it just can't stay intact, and so it'll fracture. It's too much of a hydrostatic stress state, stress tri triaxiality, where it would drive the fracture, and the fracture would propagate everywhere. And so this is one of the many reasons why silicon, even though it's so much better for the storage capacity, would, would, um, is not being inserted into the, the commercial lithium ion batteries. There are many groups now, a prominent group, E. Chase group at Stanford, that has shown that by nanostructural, by nanostructuring silicon, you can bypass that. You can actually store lithium without uh, fracturing. But these are all nanowires, and these are, so nanowires, uh, that's great, but nanowires have, have two uh, possible short back, uh, um, shortcomings, and that is when they grow, they saturate at a certain length. So if you were real estate limited, if you only had this much space to work with, you can't grow them infinitely up, right? And then the second uh, problem is that they're completely non-resistant to shear. So, so from the structural perspective, uh, these are great, but, but there, there are some more improvements that, should be, that could be done. And so this is, this, is an, this is where we got this idea, but what if we used a nanotruss, like I showed before, it, and, then, and then lithiated it, because it's effectively a nanoribbon, right? And so if it's a nanoribbon, we should be able to use this nano size effect without cracking and without catastrophic failure. But this is the, problem, the part that I was telling you about before. It, if it's a battery electrode, we have to be able to collect the electrons so they can't be hollow, the, the core can't be hollow. So this is where the copper came in, the copper mesolattices came in really handy. So this, this is the work uh, of my former student, Wendy, and then Xiaoxing Sha is actually the student who is presenting this tomorrow. And um, um, you, if you're interested, you should go see his poster. But, but this is Xiaoxing lithiating one of these structures. So this is a, and I'm showing you this yellow one as an example. Do you see it lithiating? Do you see it magnifying and, and blowing up? Right, so it blew up quite a bit, but I don't see any catastrophic cracks here. And then this is the delithiation, so you could see. You could see it shrinking. So they figured out a way to lithiate and delithiate these structures without any kind of failure. So, we're, so if you're interested in this, uh, I hope that you'll come to Xiaoxing's talk. It's, it's on Tuesday, actually, uh, right before lunchtime. So he'll show you that, that he repeatedly can cycle these back and forth, back and forth, lithiate and delithiate without any, without any catastrophic failure. So there are mul multiple little cracks that get generated. So nothing is, uh, uh, nothing is perfect. But you can already see that this is a promising way to think about battery electrodes. So, so, that, so that's one, one uh, interesting pursuit here. Uh, now, another uh, research project, re research direction that we're interested in is biomedical. So these materials, we can make these nano lattices out of just about any material class, including biocompatible and biodegradable and biomedical, bi biomedically uh, relevant materials. So what you see here is one of these nano lattices that's made out of titanium, and the other one is made out of hydroxyapatite, and these are real osteoblasts, so these are real cells human cells that apparently seem to like these. So what we can do is we can tune the stiffness and the unit cell size in these nano lattices in such a way that the cells will learn to differentiate because some cells like stiffer substrates, some cells like more compliant substrates, some cells like certain materials and some like certain other materials. So it provides a really useful vehicle for studying cell behavior, not only measuring the cellular forces, but also understanding differentiation and also possibly creating artificial bone. So all of these are the structures that proliferated um, our nanotrusses, and we're working relatively closely with the doctors from UCSF and also the city, the city of Hope that we just started. Um, and actually, uh, if you're interested in bone type properties, I have another student uh, who's showing a poster also on Tuesday, Tuesday evening if you're interested uh, to learn more about this. Now, um, these are periodic micro nano lattices. And, and I uh, work at Caltech, where we effectively can only major in physics, and specifically in applied optics. So, so everybody who goes to Caltech pretty much majors in physics and then just gets a degree with a material science flavor or biology flavor or something like that. So we work uh, with a lot of applied physicists. And so of course, the, the periodicity in these structures excited several of them because they're effectively three-dimensional photonic crystals. And so what my student Vicky showed is that actually these structures are able to exhibit a photonic band gap. So what she's doing here, these are polymer structures. And so all the light, the coupling into light and the interactions with light come simply from the geometry. Nothing to do with the size effect. This is simply from the geometry. But the reason why it's important that they're polymers, uh, made out of polymer, is that when you compress them, as I show here, they compress homogeneously, and that is uniformly, right? So the overall Bragg spacing here gets reduced all at the same time, not like the layer by layer collapse that you saw before that I showed you earlier, right, where the, the part of the structure stayed completely intact and then all the other layers were, were doing the layer by layer collapse. That wouldn't be a photonic crystal. So Vicky figured out that you have to do this out of a polymer. And now what she's showing even more is that as you compress these nano lattices, 
the, sh the photonic band gap shifts. And this is in the near IR range, but you can see how tremendous the shift is. It's, a, it's an order of microns, it's about five microns. So these can be made into, for example, ultra-precise optical switches, right? So if, it would be great if we could push it into the visible so you could see it change light with compression rates. It goes from blue to green. Um, so this is, this is um, also a collaboration with Professor Jen Dion, who won this award last year um, from Stanford uh, University. So this is, this is pretty exciting. And then uh, there's one more application, and this is probably uh, something I'm particularly excited about. It's biomimicking. So I, I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, we were interested in the damage, in developing de damage tolerant materials. Turns out that nature is particularly good at this. Nature, natural hard bi biomaterials, and these are maybe seashells, maybe nacre in the seashells, beaks, bird's beaks, turtle shells. These are uh, diatoms, radiolarians. Uh, they came from Norway. This is why I'm going there, actually. Um, you can imagine that when they're in the ocean, they're subjected to extreme thermomechanical environments because they're, being they're in the salty environment, they're being banged against the sand, and there's water and, and everything. But they don't break, yet they're made out of 98% ceramic. It's another one of these situations where a material is made out almost entirely of a ceramic, which is a brittle material, but they don't break, and they're not actually that small. They're micro-sized. They're, some, of, some of the constituents are nano-sized, but some of them are micro-sized. Most of them are micro-sized. So a lot of people like to say, well, it's because of the hierarchy. And uh, sure, it might be because of the hierarchy, but it's not really clear how. What exactly does the hierarchy do? And, and so there are, many, there are many theories that exist, many observations, but, but I don't think it, uh, there's a conclusive understanding at this point of what specific role the hierarchy plays. And so with these uh, nano lattices that we've been making, what we can do is we can approach the, the problem in the inverse way. We can say we can make a model system that's very much made out of the same materials as the real hard biomaterials, but we know what the hierarchy is as in we know the construction very precisely, and we know the material properties very precisely. And now let's see what properties we get so that at least we can understand it from a very, from a very uh, logical and forward type of thinking. And so just to, to illustrate this point, I'm showing you three images here that are all approximately, so it's exactly this, relatively the same scale bar, and they're made out of approximately the same class of materials. Can you tell me which ones of these are real biological structures in which were made in my group? I hope it's not super obvious. So two, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> Any ideas? Any brave people here? It's okay. You, I'm kind of hoping you'll give me the wrong answer. The what? The middle one's what? Real? All right, we've got to try harder. You're right. This is a real radiolarian, and these two were made in our group. But you're just too good. But hopefully, uh, hopefully the, point, uh, the point I'm trying to convey here is that if you were to just look at these three, they would possibly appear very similar to you, right? And so this is the real biological structure, and these are the two structures that we have made, that my students have made, and you can already see that we can, we can replicate it pretty closely, and now we can really start studying the specific effects while locking the other uh, parameters constant. So the reason why I like this project is because, is because of this concept. So, there has been, right, I'll, uh, let me get back to this. I showed you that there's a size effect in strength, right? That was, that was my whole um, notion about some materials get stronger, some materials get weaker. But what I haven't showed you is, is there a size effect in fracture? And this is a big question because there was a theoretical work by Wajin Gao that was made, uh, done about a decade ago, which showed that at some critical length scale, the strength of the materials, or, or rather the fracture strength of the materials, shifts into this regime where it's independent of the flaw size. And in a way, one may interpret that as materials become insensitive to flaws. So when you get to be sufficiently nano, the, this, theory, this theory predicts that, that you will no longer suffer from flaws. You can make ideal materials. And so at the time when we did this work, I want to show you, right, this was um, my former postdoc, Dongchen Zheng, who is now a faculty member at KAIST, he did this experiment. This is before, this experiment we did before um, the compression of the full nano lattice like I showed you. So what Dongchen did uh, is, is he made this out of titanium nitride. So that's also a brittle ceramic. And these are also hollow. Now he's going to compress only a single unit cell. Okay, so this is, a, again, a brittle ceramic. It's hollow. I think the wall thickness may be on the order of 75 nanometers or so. And he's going to compress it. So it should absolutely shatter, right? We're going to compress it. And again, hopefully by now you're, you're uh, not expecting any of this to hold true anymore. So sure enough, he's deforming it, and he's deforming it a lot over multiple cycles. He keeps on pushing on it, and this thing is not breaking at all. 
it's not only is it not breaking, but for some reason these beam members are deflecting out of the way. So there's two effects that are happening here that are kind of strange, right? So first of all, ceramics are not supposed to bend. If you try to bend a piece of chalk, it doesn't bend, right? It'll snap. So, and secondly, he's doing this repeatedly, and it's absolutely not breaking. So what, what's going on here? Now, since they're deflecting, we couldn't calculate the stresses very precisely, so we had to do some FEM modeling to understand the stress and strain distribution within these beams. They're also elliptical, so, so the bend, there's clearly a bending moment. So it turns out that the answer to one of the questions is very simple. Why are they deflecting? turns out that these structures are slightly imperfect. So if you look at it from the top, you'll see that there's a little bit of an offset between the, the diametrically opposite beams. And because of this offset, when you start pushing on it, it generates a torque. And when there's a torque, there's going to be a bending moment on these, right? So that torque, because of this imperfection, generates a bending moment with each of the beams deflecting out of the way. So uh, my student Lucas did these calculations. And so you can see that this is the Mises, the equivalent stress and strain distribution within these uh, beam members. So you can see that the, the point of the maximum deflection, of course, also corresponds to the point of the maximum Mises stress, which he calculated to be about 2.5 GPA. That's very high. That's a very, very high stress for a ceramic to be experiencing without breaking. If you convert it to a tensile stress, it's at about 1.75 GPA. So this is very, this is a fraction, uh, maybe 1 30th of the modulus. All ceramics, absolutely should have broken already by this point. But these don't, for some reason. And, and he does this over, they, they do this over multiple cycles. I, I believe they did it over 30 cycles. And they never broke. And there were never any cracks forming in there. So there's something very interesting that's going on in these nano-sized ceramics that's supposed to be brittle. So maybe, this, maybe, maybe there really is some kind of an insensitivity to flaws that's going on. So that's the big question, especially since there is this theory uh, here. And so I'm going to leave it on a cliffhanger because I think my time is about up. And uh, so if you'd like to know the answer whether or not there is size effect and fracture and do materials, in fact, become uh, insensitive to flaws at the nanoscale, it turns out that I, I'm giving a talk tomorrow as well uh, at 1.30. So if, you, if you're interested, please, please uh, come. And I'll, I think I'm this, at this point I'd like to summarize what I showed you. It was a lot of information, and, and thank you for, for staying. So I wanted to... I'm hopeful that by now the title makes a little more sense. So if you walk out of here with just a single message, what I'd like to convey here is this. At these, it, it is possible to make materials that are both ultra lightweight and mechanically robust, damage tolerant, strong, thermally insulating, whatever it is that you want. We no longer have to be slaves to these coupled properties that have plagued us for centuries at this point. And the, re the way we can do this is that we have to very cleverly look at three things simultaneously. We have to look at the architecture, which is the, the actual designed structure here. We have to look at the material and how, it, it, how its nanometer size affect, affects its properties. And we have to look at the microstructure, and that is the atomic makeup. So the combination of these three, the microstructure, the architecture, and the nano size effect, will absolutely give you, enable you to create these entirely new classes uh, of materials. And this is just some more of the, of the neat structures that we made. And with that, I'd like to thank all the, all the funding agencies that have enabled us to, to really do this really exciting, at least to us, uh, research. And most importantly, the, my group, my research group, this is our retreat just last, last uh, month. We went to Lake Arrowhead. They're really amazing. They do tremendous uh, research and they challenge me every day. So it's really thanks to them for this award. And thank you. Do I get questions? Thank you very much. I was very fascinating, and I really enjoy the fact that you balance providing a playground to the mechanics community while still challenging us to look at real applications such as structural dampening and, and medical applications. We have time for maybe just two or three questions. And if you could step to the mic, please. Great talk. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Question. As you made it with copper, the structure, could you make it with tungsten? Um, we could. We would have to explore. We can't electroplate tungsten. Tungsten is not one of the metals that you can electroplate relatively easily. What we can do is make a tungsten alloy, for example, or we can use sputtering to fill in the holes. So it is possible. It's not something we've done already, but it's possible to make just about anything. You just have to figure out a way to do it. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that in order to make these structures, it takes a lot of time. 
and you have two photons coming in to, uh, right? Could you use laser interference lithography to scale up? Absolutely. We're actually writing a proposal. There's a call that just came out of NSF on scalable nano manufacturing. So, I'm, thank you for this question. So, interference lithography, I feel that interference lithography is, is a really reasonable way to scale these up. Now, I think a wise approach to scalability on these is not to try to make very large chunks of material. Instead, we should figure out how to make a whole lot of small uh, chunks of materials. Because these would, would be perfect for, perfect for for almost any biomedical application, right? And where you need the small size, and you can, you can already get a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak, in the small. Uh, so we need a mass production to make a lot of small things instead of some very large things. For the interference lithography, the three-dimensional interference lithography would have to be done with a laser that's able to attain that resolution. The problem is that 3D lithography, of course, already exists, but its resolution is not high enough to capture the size effect. So that's the problem right now. So if we could do interference lithography in 3D with two photon, with a two photon approach, absolutely, that would be the ultimate uh, uh, approach, and that's something we're thinking about right now. Um, as of now, this hasn't been developed yet, which is why we're hoping to to propose this. But yeah, I I, I feel that that in combination with maybe a roll to roll process would be the way to go. Yeah. And last question over here, please. Do you think you could preserve the strength when you're scaling up to a large object, or would you, uh, again, find more failure points? No, absolutely. That's the, the, the power of this approach is exactly that, that you get the properties of a nano ribbon, but in a structure that's as large as you want it to be. Because then any, at any given point, your material is only as big as the wall thickness. And another thing we discovered that actually uh, further uh, confirms this point is that it's actually relatively insensitive to flaws. So you can think of this, it's a lattice. So there's a certain connectivity. So what would happen if you took out one beam? What would happen if you took out two? What would happen if you took out 80? How is it going to react? So what my student Lauren is discovering is that the fracture in these occurs almost independently of whether there is a flaw, a prefabricated flaw, or not. So it turns out that the lattices themselves, there's something to be said about the insensitivity to the pre-existing notches. So they're relatively forgiving in terms of the fracture toughness at the very least. And the strength, um, same thing, the strength will, will go with what the wall thickness is. So I, I hope it will stay. So I, I'm sure we could all continue the conversations, but uh, as you see, uh, we have a, a talk tomorrow, and then you're going to be around for a few I'm days. I'm going to be around, yeah. So let's again thank, thank you for your um, wonderful uh, achievement and also your really illuminating talk tonight. Thank you so much. Aww. Aww.